Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Every time I show this film of the launch of Explorer 1, people ask me, why is the nose of that rocket spinning? And this spin is an example of a common technique in rocket launches used to help with stability. At the time, it was really a quick hack by the Army's uh, team, ballistic missiles team, headed by Werner von Braun, so that they would be in a position to be able to launch a satellite into orbit before anybody else. They had the Jupiter C rocket and they developed it and demonstrated everything they needed to put a satellite into orbit, but the politics at the time was a little sensitive and they didn't get to go until after the Navy's vanguard had failed, but then they would prove the design in January of 1958. So this spinning is all about making a rocket fly straight. Now getting your rocket engine thrust aligned perfectly with the rest of the spacecraft is never guaranteed and if, if you're even slightly off centre then the rocket will turn. So by spinning the rocket stages it helps them fly straight and it's a combination of the gyroscopic effect and the fact that if there's any off centre thrust it will be averaged out by the rotation. So the Juno 1 launches of the Explorer satellites are the most obvious example of this since you can actually see the spinning upper stage on the pad. Um, Juno 1 itself was an evolution of the Redstone missile with stretched fuel tanks and it used a higher energy fuel known as Hydine. Although according to some accounts, the inventor of the fuel, Mary Sherman Morgan, she suggested it should be called Bagel because it would be paired with liquid oxygen. Hydine was 60% unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, UDMH, and 40% diethylene triamine, data, and it delivered about 12% better performance than the standard fuel used in the Redstone. The downside, of course, is that Hydine was a lot more toxic, while many people had proven that the alcohol used to fuel the Redstone was safe enough to drink. The second, third and fourth stages of the Juno were clusters of off-the-shelf solid rocket motors called Baby Sergeants because they were basically small versions of the late larger Sergeant missile, the same fuel composition. Each would be about 1.2 metres long, uh, 15 centimetres wide and it generated about 700 kilograms of thrust for 6 seconds. So the second stage would have 11 of these in a ring. Inside that, there would be three more that would be the third stage. And then on top of that, you would have a final fourth stage with a single rocket motor and the Explorer satellite attached on top of that. So the Juno 1 had these rocket clusters and they put them in a structure called the bucket, which added some aerodynamic cover so that it wouldn't get damaged. And this itself sat on an electrically driven turntable, which at time of launch would be spinning at about 560 RPM. During the flight, they would increase the spin rate and it would eventually reach about 750 RPM. The reason you change the spin rate, by the way, is that it stopped it lingering at any unfortunate frequencies which might uh, be in resonance with the rest of the structure, which could lead to oscillations, resonances and damage. So that spinning bucket is what we are seeing during the takeoff of Juno. So the Juno rocket would fire its engines for 155 seconds and it would accelerate up, down range, taking the spacecraft towards space. After the engines cut, the vehicle would coast upwards, then the guidance section would separate and it would use thrusters to orient the spinning section to point it down range. And to be clear, this isn't as simple as you might think because a lot of it is a spinning mass on the top, so you have to account for the gyroscopic precession of, you know, caused by applying thrust to this. Uh, the vehicle would reach apogee at about 360 kilometers, six and a half minutes into flight. And at that point, they would then fire the three stages in sequence. And each would take like six seconds to fire, two seconds to stage. And so about 30 seconds later, Explorer 1 would finally get into orbit. And the beauty of this is that the rocket's guidance hardware with the sensors, gyroscopes, thrusters, that didn't need to go all the way into orbit. They did the job of pointing the final dumb stages in the right direction and then firing them at the right time. And that meant that the final three stages could be much lighter, much simpler, and that really helped them with performance. Although I should say that the Explorer 1 satellite was easily the most complex scientific satellite launched at the time. It was packed with more instruments than either Sputnik 1 or Vanguard. 
So yes, yeah, spin stabilization, it's still a, a very useful technique and it's still used. Um, many spacecraft use a solid rocket motor for the final stage. Uh, the most common one in the US are the STAR series of motors, which were developed by Thiokol and I think Northrop Grumman sell them these days. The STAR-37 was used as a final boost for Pioneer and Voyager. The STAR-48 was used by New Horizons. The number refers to the diameter of the motor casing in inches. So depending upon the mission requirements, these motors can be available with steerable thrust vectoring nozzles so that they can control it and make it fly straight, or they can ditch that extra mass and complexity and they can be spin stabilized and hopefully improving the performance as a result. But that does mean that when they are finished, the spacecraft is spinning rapidly and the spacecraft has to handle that spin afterwards. So some spacecraft actually just live with that spin as part of their operation because it didn't matter what way they're oriented, but others, they need to slow down the spin uh, to their operating conditions. Now, D-spin can be performed with just regular RCS thrusters, but there's actually a really cool trick called yo-yo D-spin. And what you have here is there's a pair of heavy masses attached to wires that as the thing is spinning, these wires extend out and it slows down the rotation because of the conservation of angular momentum. The angular momentum of a mass rotating around a central point is proportional to the square of the distance uh, to the center. So the cables used in yo-yo D-spin systems are long. I know that the Dawn mission, it used 12 meter cables with three kilogram masses. Also, in the case of Dawn, the dynamics of the unspooling masses were tuned so that they didn't just slow the rotation of the, the spacecraft, they actually reversed it a little just before release. And they actually needed to do this because when the satellite is spinning, uh, the fuel tanks inside it, the liquid is spinning inside that, and when they stopped it spinning, the fuel continues to spin. So by having it, giving it a little backward spin, as the fuel you know, slows down and equalizes, uh, it all ends up canceling out and the entire satellite stops spinning neatly and then it can go about and do its mission. So yo-yo D-spin is generally not used for spacecraft that are intended to stay in Earth orbit because it creates extra space debris. It's used for suborbital sounding rockets because they are falling back to Earth and they're actually it's a very fast way of de-spinning the rocket. And also it's used for missions to deep space. There is at least one case I know where uh, a mass that was used for a de-spin system was a collision hazard for the International Space Station. But also it's kind of cool to think there's a pair of these like dumb masses headed out of the solar system at escape velocity and because they were used on the New Horizons spacecraft. And if you think about it, these discarded masses, uh, they're effectively lost in space. In fact, these ones on New Horizon are probably the most lost in space object created by humans because they're so small we could never see them and we don't know their original orbit. So they are, they are total mysteries out there. But finally, I want to come back to Explorer 1 because the spin actually led to an unexpected scientific observation. So the satellite was originally rotating around its longitudinal axis, around its long axis like a bullet. But over time, it transitioned to a slower rotation mode and an end over end tumbling motion. And this actually confused the engineers because conservation of energy and angular momentum should have kept it stable. It's this object spinning in a vacuum. What's gonna change things? You generally, objects uh, will spin around preferred axes. If you try to spin it around another axis, which is not stable, it, it'll flip orientation. And there's this great video on the space station of this T-shaped handle flipping between two rotational orientations because uh, that's not one of its preferred orientations. So Explorer 1 should have been stable around its original rotational axis because a change to any other rotational axis would require it to change its rotational kinetic energy. And that in a vacuum is, is hard, right? Where is it getting rid of it? But it turns out that after it was released, it deployed flexible antenna. And as it, these were perturbed, they would flex and the flexing would actually convert a small amount of the kinetic energy into heat. And as it did this, 
it meant that the thing had to rotate more slowly and to rotate more slowly it had to change its rotational axis. So over time these flexible antennas drove the rotation into this slower end over end state. And that's actually important for modern satellite design because you want to make sure that if your satellite is going to be rotating that it's not going to flip into another rotational state because it dissipates energy. And yeah, this is a cool thing because Explorer 1 would never have observed this if it wasn't for the design of the spacecraft being optimized around this spin stabilized hack, trying to put things into orbit as quickly as possible. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.